I'm Dr. Anna Hurst, a clinical geneticist at the Department of Genetics at University of Alabama at Birmingham. And today I'll be joined by Ashley Cannon, genetic counselor in the department. We're going to talk to you about the roles of medical geneticists and genetic counselors in clinical genetics clinic. There are many types of professionals in the field of genetics. These include medical geneticists, genetic counselors, scientists, and nurses. Today we are going to focus on medical geneticists and genetic counselors, as these are the most common professionals your patients may encounter in the clinic. Medical geneticists are medical doctors who have specialized training in genetics and genomics. Typically, they complete an initial residency program in a primary care field, like pediatrics or internal medicine, followed by a second, two-year residency in genetics and genomics. However, there are new combined programs where an individual can complete dual residencies in genetics and another field simultaneously in four to five years. After genetics residency, some clinicians choose to subspecialize in a focused area of medical genetics, such as biochemical or laboratory genetics and genomics, which combines cytogenetic and molecular training. Nationally, the field is the newest member of the American Board of Medical Specialties and one of the smallest. There are over 1,500 medical geneticists currently practicing, and 92% are involved in direct patient care. The primary role of a geneticist is to diagnose and manage conditions which have a genetic basis, which is incredibly broad. Diagnosis may sometimes be based on clinical features alone. For example, some conditions do not have a confirmatory DNA-based test available, such as the hypermobility subtype of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Or sometimes, when there's a known genetic condition that runs through the family, someone with clinical findings may not need their own genetic testing. However, when a laboratory-based test is needed, the geneticist's job is to select the most appropriate test for the patient given the type of condition on the differential. Testing can be genetically or biochemically based. They must also evaluate and interpret the results. When a genetic diagnosis is confirmed, there may be specific medical management recommendations. For many conditions, there are published management guidelines, and the geneticists can assist the patient's primary care team with customizing a plan best suited for that patient's diagnosis. For rare conditions, no formal guidelines may be available. In those cases, a geneticist may review the literature to learn about the potential complications which accompany a condition and develop recommendations in a truly individualized manner. Some geneticists will provide therapeutic services, such as management of inborn errors of metabolism with medical foods and formulas, or providing enzyme replacement therapy to people with storage disorders. We work closely with the patient's existing medical teams, both primary care providers and their subspecialists, to use the patient's genetic diagnosis to improve overall medical care. We can also evaluate the chance of similar genetic conditions occurring in other family members, their parents, siblings, or children. Many patients who had a de genetic diagnosis made decades ago return to clinic in their adult years to discuss the risk of their own children inheriting a similar condition. Or if a person has a relative with a genetic condition, they may come to clinic to ask about their own health and if evaluation or testing is indicated. Each discussion is personalized based on the disorder, the family history, and the patient's health. Medical geneticists may also provide counseling and support services to help patients cope with the ramifications of having a genetic condition for themselves or a loved one. Each specific genetic condition you learn about may be individually rare, but collectively, these conditions are common. The definition of a rare disease is one which affects fewer than 200,000 Americans, but there are over 7,000 rare diseases and although not all are genetic, many are. This means in the United States, nearly one in 10 people are affected with a rare disease. In Alabama, that's over 480,000 people. One of the things I love about this field is that it allows me to think about a diverse range of conditions involving almost any organ system across the entire lifespan. We also can follow all members of a family as a condition may impact each family member differently. Our diagnostic skills must be focused on the entire patient, their life history, and that can be even prenatal or early childhood development, and subtle findings that can be clues to a larger diagnosis. We often seek historical records from other providers to ensure we have the precise diagnostic terminology of a patient's features. Our physical exam is also unique, 
As many geneticists are dysmorphologists, meaning they are trained to recognize facial developmental patterns and distinct features unique to a particular syndrome. I also enjoy the field of genetics because we get to utilize cutting-edge genomic testing in the direct assessment of our clinic patients. Genetic testing is one of the most complicated aspects of our field, as new tests are rapidly expanding. It's estimated that over 75,000 genetic tests are on the market, and 10 new tests are added daily. This can be a lot to keep up with, and geneticists are constantly learning about new tests approved for clinical use, such as exome and genome sequencing, or epigenetic methylation signature test. Each test has its own value, for example. And although exome and genome sequencing is an exciting new way to look at the full expanse of a person's DNA, it has limitations, and it does not replace traditional methods of chromosome karyotyping for chromosome rearrangements. It's important to recognize the limitations of each test, because a patient may assume that if they've had one type of genetic testing performed, it's comprehensive, which is usually not the case. Communicating this with patients and families can be challenging and may be best provided in a team-based atmosphere. Geneticists may also connect a patient with specific referrals to other providers in the healthcare system for their condition-driven needs. Geneticists and genetic counselors can work together to communicate information to patients, but it may be the genetic counselor who can dedicate more time and attention to the nuances of psychosocial ramifications of learning news of a genetic diagnosis. So now my colleague, Ashley Cannon, genetic counselor, will tell you more about their field. Thank you, Dr. Hurst. As she mentioned, as the study of genetics has advanced, it has become evident that there is a need for professionals who understand genetics and can guide and support patients as they make decisions about genetic testing and their health care. So the profession of genetic counseling began in 1971. Genetic counselors have advanced training in both medical genetics and counseling. This requires a master's degree in genetic counseling. Most practicing genetic counselors are certified through the American Board of Genetic Counseling, and some are licensed, depending on the state they practice in. Currently, there are more than 4,500 certified genetic counselors. Genetic counselors work in a variety of practice settings and provide different services. Most genetic counselors work in a clinic or hospital and often work with doctors like geneticists, obstetricians, and oncologists. Genetic counselors may provide general care or specialize in one or more areas. Traditionally, genetic counselors are in clinics or hospitals, but their, set, their practice settings are rapidly expanding. These may include research development, diagnostic laboratories, educational and medical websites, pharmaceutical industry, public health, marketing and product development, policy development, and advocacy. Specialties in the hospital environment include prenatal and preconception, pediatrics, cancer, cardiovascular, neurology, and the new fields of pharmacogenetics and genomics. During a clinical visit, a genetic counselor will help patients understand the risks based on family history, genetic risk for certain diseases or cancers, whether genetic testing is appropriate, and what genetic testing results mean for a patient and his or her family. With expertise in counseling, genetic counselors can also provide the emotional support and empower patients as he or she makes decisions. This is a clinical example of when a geneticist and a genetic counselor would be working together for a patient encounter. Let's say Dr. Hurst and I are meeting Tommy in the clinic as he has a history of developmental delay. I would first obtain medical history records related to the reason for the referral or any other medical concerns. When I meet the family, I would gather medical and family history from his parents. During this discussion, I learned that he, the mother has two brothers with developmental delay and intellectual disability. I then share this information with Dr. Hurst. She would begin to perform a differential based on the history and then perform a physical exam specifically assessing for features seen in genetic syndromes of concern. In this scenario, Tommy has a large head size, long face, and large ears. The ACMG first tier recommended test for a child with developmental delay is a chromosomal microarray. So the geneticist would order this test. Because the child's physical features plus the family history, are suspicious for Fragile X syndrome, 
she would also order trinucleotide repeat testing for the FMR1 gene, another first-line test for a child with delays. The genetic counselor would discuss the potential results and limitations and benefits of these tests during the consent process. When we see the family in a return visit after the results are available, we discuss that the results are positive for Fragile X syndrome and recommend testing for other family members. Dr. Hurst will discuss the medical management plan while I provide counseling and resources for the family. If you would like to refer a patient to the UAB Genetics Clinic, the phone and fax number is listed here. You can also use the UAB MIST system. We have genetic physicians on call 24-7. If a patient or their family members are not local, you should check out findageneticcounselor.com. This is a directory of over 3,300 genetic counselors in the U.S. and Canada. It can assist physicians and patients in accessing genetic counseling services. There is also a search option to filter by location, specialty, and even virtual capabilities. If you are interested in a genetic counseling training program, you are in luck. There are more than 40 genetic counseling programs in the United States and counting. UAB is the only program in the state of Alabama. The career outlook for genetic counselors is highly optimistic. The genetic counseling profession is rapidly expanding and diversifying. Graduates of the UAB genetic counseling program typically have job offers before graduation. Since 2006, the number of genetic counselors has grown by 85%, and there is still a need for more genetic counselors, as evidenced by more jobs available than practicing genetic counselors. To learn more, visit nsgc.org. There are also several genetic residency training programs. Medical genetics residency training programs are offered as a variety of training tracks. All tracks lead to eligibility for the American Board of Medical Genetics Examination and Medical Genetics. The training tracks are different by institution, and the UAB program includes categorical genetics, pediatrics and genetics, internal medicine and genetics, maternal fetal medicine and genetics, and biochemical genetics fellowship. Thank you.